As I ground out the stub end of my smoke, I looked at myself in a shop window for a few moments, turning from side to side. My face grew older as I watched. The man in the glass shook his head as if to say, I don't believe you, boy. Are you really going to do this? Then I turned back because I heard the street door grinding on its hinge and there was Clémence standing on the threshold. That was Sebastian Folks reading from his latest novel, Paris Echo, and he's in the studio to tell us more. Sebastian Folks, thanks so much for joining us. Now, the title of your latest book is Paris Echo, which makes sense regarding the story. But in terms of the structure of the book, I think it could also be a love letter to the Paris Metro. <laughs> Since you've titled every chapter of the book with a metro station, you're clearly a fan of the metro. Why it's is that? It's a great that? system. I first came to Paris when I was 17, and um, I'd never lived in a capital city before. And I was entranced by the metro, I think most of all by its smell. And even though, obviously, I'm English, I'm not French, it seemed to me the smell seemed to capture something of the nostalgic essence. And even as a kid, I thought, how French people abroad in Indochina or Martinique or Algeria must have longed for the, the sweet smell of the metro and home. And also, of course, it was the incredibly exotic names of all the stations, which I found very entrancing, and the fact that it worked really well. It does work quite well. I don't know about the smell, though. Now, what's your favourite station? My favourite station... Oh, that's a good question. Um, I suppose I like uh, Bir Akhaim. Uh, I love the, the metro when it goes across the river and then for about four stations going south of that, it's raised like an elevated train. That's my favourite bit. That's a very glamorous station. Now, to get back to the story, Paris Echo delves into French history via modern day characters and also figures from the past. One of your protagonists, an academic, Hannah, has this very studious, methodical approach to her research. There's a lot of historical detail in your novel. Are you a closet historian, just moonlighting as a best-selling author? Uh, I don't think I'd have ever had the patience to be a real historian because they, it takes them 30 years to produce one pamphlet this long. I'm very much an amateur and I came to history really through the writing of fiction and I wanted to set my own novels back in a time uh, to begin with where I felt the, the moral weight of choices was heavier than today. Um, and then because of then having to research the period, first of all, the 1930s in France, I became interested in that period, and that led me back into the First World War, which was such a cataclysmic event in France, and, well, for the whole world, of course, but particularly for France. Um, and I began to see that what I really wanted to write about in my fiction was the way that the private lives and passions and emotions of individuals are influenced in ways they may not be aware of by the big public movements of history before them. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of reflection about what went on in the Second World War in this book, mm. like many of your books, the attitude of French people towards the Vichy government, the resistance, and there's a British character as well who has a different relationship with his country. What were you trying to say about the nature of patriotism? Uh, it's not really a book about patriotism. It's a book about uh, how, how much you need to know in order to live a worthwhile life. And Paris, for me, was the perfect place to set this book, one, because I, I find Paris a fascinating city. I don't, incidentally, have the usual English-British person's love of croissant, the little pavement cafe. I don't really like croissant. I don't like café au lait, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I have a much more complex relationship with the city, which I've often found quite difficult. But the way that it was going to work for me was because it's so um, open about its past. Every metro station, every street name celebrates a great French citizen. Um, in a, but, and yet, a lot of the recent history of France is uh, still undigested. Uh, a great deal, I think, of the Second World War, what took place there, is still yet to be fully reconciled to the satisfaction of everybody. So it was the question of so open and yet so closed, and that's what made it um, interesting for my book, I think. Indeed, the past is, is a really important theme in the book and in your novels generally. This idea of memory, do you think more globally for France or anywhere else, it's important to keep history alive and relevant, or should we look, be looking towards the future? Well, the question of how you commemorate and how you remember and how you deal with your past is, is again, very active. We're thinking about the centenary of the First World War, and I've been involved a lot with the commemorations in Britain, and the, the whole thrust of it has been education of the young and, and, and all that. But, you know, what are we really trying to tell the young? It's not so simple things like don't murder an archduke in Sarajevo. I mean, they figure that out for themselves. And... 
you have to make a tr you have to digest your past you have to deal with it it's like a trauma in a family um, it has to be acknowledged dealt with sometimes a way of dealing with it is just locking it up and sometimes that's not the best way to deal with it. It's always risky to lock things up because then they can explode many years later. Your book makes many references to the greats of French literature. Uh, Albert de Musset, Zola, even Victor Hugo makes a cameo. And now we're going to take a look at a seasonal phenomenon in the French publishing industry. That is the rentrée littéraire. The autumn months are when the bulk of books are published and bought here in France. Sanam Chantier tells us more. It's that time of the year again here in France. After a lengthy summer break, September sees the return of scholars and teachers to their lessons, employees to their workplace, and a colourful array of books to the display rack. This year, it's a dizzying selection of 567 novels from prominent names and unknown authors alike, and for publishing houses, the stakes are high. Around 50% of their publications are sold during autumn across the country. The rentrée littéraire, which can be described as the literary comeback, is a very French tradition. It also coincides with the season of literary prizes. The oldest and most prestigious accolade is the Prix Goncourt, established in 1903. Previous winners include Marcel Proust, Simone de Beauvoir and, most recently, Leila Slimani. Now, for this so-called comeback to succeed, marketing is essential for some publishers. Over the recent years, they've also started to work with social media networks and influencers. In general, these are women who post online reviews. These are influencers who have a community of around 25 to 30,000 followers. So we do double the work because we have the publicity and the journalistic elements to deal with. We also have to do all the work to present our product and attract those bloggers who talk about our books. But for the more traditional reader, the press and word of mouth still play an essential role in this literary comeback. First and foremost, I buy books of authors that I'm familiar with, but then I start looking to critics and certain literary programmes. Whatever the sale technique, the French love to read. Last year, 111 million copies were sold across the country. What about yourself as a confirmed uh, francophile? Do you keep up with the rentrée littéraire? Any contemporary French authors on your list? Yes, I just uh, read one of the books uh, mentioned there, Leila Slemani. I finished it this morning, actually, and a previous Goncourt winner. Uh, so, and Patrick Modiano, when he won the Nobel Prize, I, I read some of his books, yeah. Ah, so not only the classics. Now, I wanted to move on to a previous novel of yours from almost 10 years ago now, A Week in December, touches on the rise of Islamic fanaticism in London, actually, and that seems prescient in terms of the front pages we've seen here in France and Belgium as well because you know all European countries are grappling with the issue of integration globally and then in more isolated mm. cases radicalization where do you think things have gone so wrong oh that's a huge question <laughs> there are many one of the things which interests me is that so terrorism which claims to have an Islamic basis though obviously proper Islam would completely disown these uh, terrible acts um, is quite different in, the, in every country. Um, and in America, it's different from Great Britain, and from, in Britain, it's different from in France. And the main way in which it's different in France is that uh, France obviously has its colonial past um, in Algeria and Morocco, where it's the occupying p colonial power. And the Algerian War of Independence was a very brutal and uh, unpleasant uh, episode on both sides. And it's arguable that a great deal of the um, fundamental resentments felt by um, certain extreme young men have close connections with a sort of unfinished history in that part of the world, rather than by some misinterpretation of scripture, which is how you might characterize them in other parts of the world. Now one of the institutional consequences of the Second World War, which is a great theme in your book, uh, was the creation of the European Union. It doesn't feature in your novels. But um, now that the EU and the UK are parting ways, how do you see European-British relationship heading for, you know, looking forwards? The idea of our neighbourliness and our friendship long precedes the invention of this, frankly, cumbersome um, bureaucratic edifice of the EU. I... Um, I was heartbroken that we 
opted to leave it, partly because Britain had such an incredibly good deal and we were net beneficiaries, even financially. And the people who led the um, Leave campaign basically lied uh, about the, what possibilities were, were open to Britain outside the EU. But I remain quite um, positive that there are people who, who, you know, the culture, culturally, historically, politically, in a much grander, bigger way than just, you know, the question of how the EU functions out of uh, Belgium and Strasbourg. There are things, there are friendships, there are cultural connections uh, which will go on and will, will endure and outlast whatever catastrophe Britain has voted on itself in the short term. Well, we're wrapping up the show with a case of European cultural exchange, albeit from the past, uh, via the method of painting. You've pointed us in the direction of an exhibition of French Impressionism with an English twist. Tell us more. Yeah, I went to see this uh, this morning. It's the Impressionists in London, which is showing at the Petit Palais here in Paris. And there's something slightly comic, of course, about Pissarro and Monet and the way uh, Pissarro has painted uh, scenes from suburban South London. It looks a little bit like Louvain. It still looks like France, uh, even when he paints a cricket match in front of Hampton Court. Uh, and but the exhibition is interesting, I think largely because of the background of the two cities, Paris going emerging from an appalling trauma, about to go into a rather splendid period. Uh, London at the height of its imperial power, very smoggy, very dirty, very industrial, about to go downhill, actually. Uh, and these paintings suggest that, that very interesting moment in the, in the, in the city's uh, respective lives. Oh, I want to catch then. Thank you so much for joining us, Sebastian Fox. My pleasure. You can see that show, Impressionists in London, at the Petit Palais here in Paris. We'll leave you with a preview. Remember to check out our website and you can also keep up with Encore on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. The coca plant is illegal in Colombia, yet it remains the country's most widely grown plant. The farms in the region of Catatumbo have turned into battlegrounds. Several organizations are fighting to take over since the FARC area disarmed. They are battling each other to gain control of the area, leaving locals caught in the crossfire. In an attempt to lower tensions, the government has implemented a coca substitution plan. But this anti-drug policy isn't working out as planned. Our special correspondents are the real eyewitnesses of the news. Join me for reporters. 